Hi everyone, it's Miss Costa here and in this video I'm going to be going through some revision to help you with the calculator papers. So here's our first question which is dealing with the equation of a circle. Now in general the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals r squared where x and y are just the but x and y coordinates and r represents the radius. So to give you an example of what I mean, and this is assuming that the center, the circle has a center zero, zero. So here's my circle. Um, it can be any circle anywhere. And if I just pick a point, let's say this point over here, um, what I do is I list the x coordinate and the y coordinate. So let's just assume that the x coordinate is five and the y coordinate here is three. What I can do is use Pythagoras to figure out therefore what the radius must be because the radius is always a distance from the center to the outside. And if I know the vertical length and the horizontal length, I can work that out. And because it's center zero, zero, the y distance is always gonna be whatever the y coordinate is. Because how do you get from three to zero? That's a distance of three. How do you get from five to zero? That's a distance of five. So therefore I would have done five squared plus three squared equals r squared um, and, and use Pythagoras to work it out. So I use this equation to figure out um, the equation of any circle that has a center zero, zero. So I'm told that the equation of a circle is x squared plus y squared equals 36. That must mean that the radius squared is 36. So therefore, if I solve this equation and I do the square root both sides, r would be 6. So the radius of this circle is 6. And therefore, uh, if the radius is 6, the diameter is going to be 12 because the radius is just the line from the centre to the outside of the circle and the diameter is the whole line. So from one edge to the other going through the radius. So the diameter is always double the radius. Okay, next question. A circle centre zero passes through seven zero. So let's just draw a sketch of this. So the x coordinate is seven and the y coordinate is zero. So that must mean that it has, because this would be the radius over here along the x axis. So that must mean the radius of the circle is seven and therefore that would be seven, over here would be seven, and over here would be, oh uh, well, negative seven and negative seven. So that would be my circle. And how do I write the equation of a circle? I write x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Well, I know in this case that seven, x is seven, so seven squared plus zero squared is r squared, which is 49. Does that make sense? So the I substitute the x coordinates I've been given to figure out what r squared must be. So the full equation of this circle is going to be x squared plus y squared equals 49. So in this question, I am forming and solving linear equations. So I'm going to look at what information is provided to me and try and form an equation. So I'm shown two rectangles and I'm told that the area of the shaded rectangle is a sixth of the area of the large rectangle. So let's first work out what the area of the large rectangle must be. So the large rectangle has a length of x plus two and a width of 18. So if I expanded that, that would be 18x plus 36. I just multiplied 18 by two and 18 by x. So the area of the large rectangle is 18x plus 36. The small triangle, I am told, is a sixth of this. So I just need to do 18x plus 36 divided by six. So 18 divided by six is three. So the small rectangle is going to be three x and 36 divided by six is six. So the small rectangle is three x plus six. The large rectangle is 18x plus 36. Um, I need to work out the value of x. So what I want to do is make my equation equal to something. So I know the small, the expression for the small rectangle is 3x plus 6. Now let's see if I can find another expression. So I know that this distance here is x. 
all of this distance is x plus 2, so the missing part over here must be 2. So that length there is 2. I know that this whole length here is 18. So therefore, this must also be 18. But to work out this length here, I'm going to need to subtract x. So this length here of the base of the, tri the small triangle is going to be 18 take x. So this is just going to be 18 take x. So another way <coughs> of writing my the area of the small triangle would be 2 brackets 18 takes x, i.e. 2 times by 18 take x. If I expand that, that would be 36 take 2x. So what I can do is make the two equations that I, the, the two expressions that I formed equivalent to each other because I know that that's just one way of expressing the area of the small rectangle and that's another way of expressing the area of the small rectangle. So 36 take 2x must equal 3x plus 6 as they are expressions for the same area. Let's rearrange it. So if I add 2x to both sides, I'm just solving. So 36 equals 5x plus 6. And then I take 6 from both sides. So 30 equals 5x. And then I can divide by 5. So x would be 6. And that's how I do that question. So here I'm being asked to solve um, two algebraic fractions. So when I've got something, when I'm being asked to solve anything, the whole point of what I'm doing is I'm trying to isolate the x variable on one side on its own so I can see what it's equal to. So as you can see, we've got x on both sides, so we're going to need to jiggle things around so that x is just on one side. So what I can start is um, just multiplying both sides of the equation by the denominator. So let's do it one at a time. So let's multiply both sides by x squared plus 3, whatever the denominator is. Remember, the reason I do that is because if something is being divided by something and multiplied by the same thing, it cancels out. So I get to cancel this out on this side. So I'd be left with 5 brackets x squared plus 3 over 3x plus 1 equals 2x. And then what I can do is multiply both sides by the denominator of this fraction. So... I'd be left with 5 brackets x squared plus 3 equals 2x brackets 3x plus 1. And remember, we put anything in brackets um, if it's two terms that need to stick together. We put them in brackets because they can't be separated. So I've got some brackets. Most likely, I'm going to want to expand them. So let's have a go at expanding. So that would be 5 times x squared is 5x squared. 5 times 3 is 15. 2x times 3x would be 6x squared, and 2x times 1 is 2x. Now I want to rearrange everything so that um, it's a quadratic, so I'm going to need to factorise it, but let's just put everything onto one side. So let's move this 5x squared. I always try and move the smallest one so that I don't end up with negatives. So I'd be left with 15 equals x squared plus 2x. And then I can just move the 15, so subtract 15 from both sides. So I'd be left with x squared plus 2x. Take 15 must equal 0. Okay, so that's my quadratic that I found. And now I'm solving it. So when I solve a quadratic, what I need to do is factorise it so that I can find out the two solutions. So let's see what I can do. I'm going to factorise this. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to make um, negative 15 and add to make uh, 2. So 15 times 1 makes 15, 3 times 5. Now they need to, one needs to be a negative because a negative times a positive gives you a negative. And they also need to add to make 2x. So I'm going to go for 3 and 5. And negative 5 plus 3 would give me negative 2. So that wouldn't work. But negative 3 plus 5 would give me positive 2, so that would, bleh, that would work. So my two factors are negative 3 and 5. So I'd say x take 3, x plus 5 must equal 0. And then I just solve. So to solve it, when you've got your quadratic in a factorised form, you just, I mean, the cheat way is just writing the inverse of whatever is in the brackets. I'm going to show you why. So we're going to solve by dividing first by this bracket. So first, if we divide by x plus 5. 
Um, zero divided by anything is zero. That's why this is so cool. So we'd just be left with x take three equals zero. If I moved everything to get x on its own, I'd be left with x equals three. I can then do exactly the same thing, except with the other bracket. So I divide both sides of the equation by um, x take three. So that cancels it out here. And obviously zero divided by anything is zero. So I'm just left with x plus five must equal zero. If I subtract five from both sides, I'm left with x equals five. So my two solutions are x equals three or x equals five. And that's how I do that. So over here, I'm dealing with inequalities. I am told that n is an integer. That should say x, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, x is an integer. Write the values of x such that minus 13 is less than 2x plus 3, which is less than or equal to 13. So I'm writing the values that satisfy this inequality. So if I think about this, first I'm going to need to sol um, solve it so that it's just so that it just has x in the middle so it just makes it as easy for me as possible so when i solve an inequality that has two terms in the middle i have whatever i do to one side i have to do to the other so let's do it all at the same time so i'm going to subtract three from each part of the inequality so minus 13 take three is minus 16 must be less than 2x which is less than or equal to 13 take three is 10. And then what I can do is divide by two. So imagine like you're solving it bit by bit, but you do it to, the, to both sides. So for instance, if you were solving 2x plus 3 equals 13, the first thing you would have done is take 3. So 2x is 10, and then you would have divided by 2. So I'm doing the same thing. It's just I'm doing it to each part of the inequality. So negative 16 divided by 2 is negative 8 is less than x, which is less than or equal to five. Okay, so therefore, now what I can do is just draw a little number line just so that I can visualize what must be happening. I know that minus eight is less than, so that would be a little blank dot because it can't actually be negative eight, but I know that it can be um, five because it's less than or equal to five. So therefore, all of the numbers that are in between negative eight and negative five, I can list as satisfying this inequality. So I'd have negative seven, negative six, negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So the only one it can't satisfy is negative eight because it's negative eight is less than x. Oh, <laughs> I've kind of done. So, so represent the solution on the number line below. Well, um, the number line doesn't actually extend that far, but let's just imagine it did. So let's just imagine it was to negative eight. I draw a blank dot here. Now remember that the blank dots are if you've got a less than or a greater than, and the coloured in dots are when it can be equal to that number as well. So I'd say that it could be equal to five. So I draw a coloured in dot there, and then I just join that up. And this just represents that it could be this, it could be this, 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 this and this. That's all the number line represents. So that's how I do that. So here I've got a factorization of a quadratic and it says give your answer to two decimal places. Now if it says two decimal places you're going to be using the quadratic formula. Um, so if it, that's a huge hint, also this is a calculator paper so you know you can use the quadratic formula. So first thing I want to do is rearrange the equation so that um, everything is written in the form ax squared plus bx plus c. So let's add 5x to both sides of the equation. So x squared plus 7x plus 3 must equal 9. And then I'm going to subtract 9. So x squared plus 7x, 3 take 9 is negative 6 equals 0. Okay, so that's my quadratic. And when I use the quadratic formula, sorry, I've got a really itchy nose. So the quadratic formula is x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared take 4ac 
over 2a. So what I'm going to do is use a different colour for each little part. So every quadratic formula is written in the form ax squared plus bx plus c. And this is the formula that you use to solve a quadratic. So a is the coefficient of x squared. So in this case, a is going to be 1. Sorry, I've got a really itchy nose. Why is it so itchy? a is 1, b is 7, and c is going to be negative 6. So b is the coefficient of just x, a is the coefficient of x squared, and c is the number. So I said I'm going to use different colours, didn't I? Okay, so let's say a is 1 and c is negative 6. So I'm going to substitute these into this equation. So c is over here, uh, b is the light blue colour, so negative b, b squared, and then you've got a. Okay, so let's have a go at writing that in. So let's write it in black actually. So x must be negative something plus or minus the square root of something squared take away 4 times a times c divided by 2 times a. I'm going to fill them in in the, their appropriate colours. So first we're going to start with b. b is 7, so I'm going to say negative 7 plus or minus 7 squared. Take away 4 times and then a is 1. So I'm going to say 4 times 1 times c. And then here I've also got a, so I'm going to say 2 times 1 at the bottom. And then I'm going to fill in the c. So c is negative 6. So times negative six. Okay, so that's how I use the quadratic formula. I just substitute all the values of a, b and c into the quadratic formula and then I plug that into my calculator. So let's get rid of this working and write this out over here. So x is negative 7 plus or minus the square root of 7 squared take 4 times 1 times negative 6 over 2 times 1. I'm just going to simplify that to 2 to make life easier. Okay, so let's see what we can simplify. Well, I could say x is negative 7 and what you want to do is do 1 plus and 1 minus. So let's just start with a plus. So 7 squared is 49. Um, minus 4 times 1 is just minus 4. And then minus 4 times by minus 6 is going to be positive 24. Okay, so positive 24 in here. And then let's simplify it, and that's over 2. Let's simplify it even further. So that would be negative 7 plus, what's the square root, what's 49 plus 24? And obviously you can just substitute this all into your calculator, but I'm just going to show you how you can do it step by step until you get confident um, with doing it this way. So I'm just simplifying as much as I can. And then I can type this into my calculator. So use the fraction button, that little button over there, that gives you a fraction like that, and type in negative 7 plus the square root of 73 over 2 equals, and it will give you a search, so you press the SD button, x is 0 0.772001827. And then what we're going to want to do is we've simplified our thing as much as we can but now I'm going to do um, the subtract version so I'm going to say x is negative 7 take away square root of 73 over 2 and what does that give me well I use the fraction button again I say minus 7 take root 73 on my calculator over 2 and that gives me x is negative 7, oh, 0.772001, blah, 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 blah. So it says give your answer to two decimal places. So over here, I would say x is 0. I, I look at the second decimal place. I look next door. If the answer is less than 5, I just keep it as it is. So that would be 0 0.77. And then the same for over here, x would be, I look at the second decimal place, minus 7.77. So those are my two solutions. So with a quadratic, you're always going to have two solutions um, 
and the trick is you simplify everything inside the quadratic formula as much as you can and then one version is when you're adding the third and the other is when you're subtracting it and that's how you factorize a quadratic using the quadratic formula so over here we've got an interesting array of brackets so over here i've got a trinomial so three brackets that need to be multiplied and then i'm going to simplify it with this so let's focus on the three brackets first now my recommendation is just pick the easiest two brackets so x plus three or actually sometimes it's better to pick the hardest two let's pick the hardest two so these two over here so i'm going to multiply out 2x take four uh, multiplied by 3x plus 5 it doesn't matter you can just pick any two i'm just choosing these so let's multiply each term by each term 2x times 3x is 6x squared 2x times by 5 is 10x negative 4 times 3x is negative 12x and negative 4 times 5 is negative 20. i simplify the like terms so that would be 6x squared 10 take 12 is negative 2 take 20. Okay, so I know that this expanded is 6x squared, take 2x, take 20. So what I can do now and what I would recommend, you can obviously just expand it however you like, but I would always recommend using a grid. So drawing out a grid just to help you so that you don't miss out any terms. So you've got three terms above and two terms below. So you've got this, this thing here that is the product of this multiplied out so i'd write 6x squared take 2x take 20 and then on this side here i'm going to do x plus 3 and then i just multiply everything and fill out the box so 6x squared times x is going to give me 6x cubed that would give me 2x squared minus 20x um 18x squared minus 6x and minus 60. And then what I can do is just write it out. Now, the cool thing about this is that these diagonal terms are always going to simplify. So I could simplify it in here. So I'd write out 6x cubed. Then I know I've got 18x squared to take 2x squared, which would be 16x squared. Then I've got minus 6x minus 20x. So that would be minus 26x and then minus 60. So that's my simplified version of this expanded trinomial. Now I also need to expand this bracket here. So that would be minus 4x minus uh, 28. And then I collect the like terms. So focus on the multiplication first because, you know, bid mass always multiply first. And then we deal with this. So what are the like terms? I've got minus 26x minus 4x. So I'd be left with 6x cubed plus 16x squared, a minus 30x minus 88. And that's, that's my final answer for that one. So this question is asking me to use the equation of a line. So remember, every line is written in the form y equals mx plus c, where m represents the gradient and y is the y-intercept, so where the line crosses the y-axis. So, <coughs> line B is parallel to line A and passes through the point 37. Um, okay, so the key thing we need to know here is that parallel lines have the same gradient. So that's really handy because I can work out what the gradient of line A is. Remember, y equals mx plus c. So y equals mx plus c, the gradient here of the line y equals 3x take 2 is going to be the coefficient of x. So the gradient is always the coefficient of x. If the line was written y equals negative 2 plus 3x, don't get confused. It's not the first number. It's the coefficient of x that's the gradient. So I know that the gradient <clears throat> must be 3. Um, so the gradient of my new line of line A, my line A must be y equals 3x plus c. I don't know the y-intercept, but I just substitute what I know. However, I do know that it passes through the point 37. 
So my line y equals 3x plus c, I can substitute the point 3, 7 where x is 3 and y is 7 because remember every coordinate is always written in the form x and then y. So substitute x equals 3 and y equals 7. So 7 equals 3 times 3, 9 plus c. So to find out what c is, I'm going to subtract 9 from both sides. 7 take 9 is negative 2, so c is negative 2. And then I can substitute this into this equation. c is negative 2. So my final line, <clears throat> the equation of my line would be y equals 3x take 2. So that's the equation of line A, like line B, sorry. And now I'm being asked to work out the coordinates of where the line B, so this is the one that I've just worked out the equation for, intersects the x-axis. So the x-axis is here. So what do I know about the x-axis? Well, I don't know what the x-coordinate will be wherever this line is. Um, oh, why does it always delete it by accident? But it could be anywhere. However, at the x-axis, the y-coordinate is always going to be zero. So that's the little trick that I can use. <clears throat> so I substitute y equals zero into this equation. So zero equals 3x take two. I can solve it now. So I add two to both sides of the equation. So two equals 3x. And then I divide by three. So x equals two over three. So therefore, the coordinates of the point where the line B intersects the x-axis is, where's my line? Uh, zero is going to be the y-coordinate and the x-coordinate is two, three. So let's write that as two thirds zero. And that's how we do that. Okay, so in this question, I'm being asked to complete the square. Now, you complete the square when you can't fully factorise something. So if I try to factorise this, I know that I need to find the factors of two, which are only two and one. And there is absolutely no way that two and one can combine to add or subtract to make negative six. So I know I'm going to have to use completing the square. Now, when I use completing the square, what I do is I look at the first section of the quadratic. So the x squared take away ax or bx or whatever, just that bit. And what I do is I halve the coefficient of x, not x squared, just x. And the reason I do this is because I'm trying to think, OK, if I was trying to um, work out the area of that. So let's say x squared take away 6x. If I halved that and I turned it into two little brackets, x take 3, x take 3. And I worked out the area. I've got x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9. So what would that be? That would be x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9, which gives me x squared minus 6x plus 9. So I end up with this, this part here, just in a slightly different format. So I've got this extra bit here, which I need to try and correct because that's not the expression I've been given. I've been given the expression x squared minus 6x, which is this whole expression here can be expressed as x squared minus 6x, but I want x squared minus 6x plus 2. So <clears throat> how would I get from x squared minus 6x plus 9 to x squared minus 6x plus 2? Well, what I'd do is I'd have to subtract 7. So therefore, I can say x minus 3 squared minus 7 is the same as, is another way of expressing um, x squared minus 6x plus 2. Let's just double check it. So if I expanded that, that would be x take 3, x take 3, take 7. So that would give me x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9. Um, take 7. Let's simplify that. That becomes minus 6x, so x squared minus 6x, and 9 takes 7 gives me 2. Okay, so that's that's all I'm doing when I'm completing the square. I factorise this part here by halving the coefficient of x, and then I try and find what the difference is from what that expression gives me to the original expression. So therefore, the values of a is um, 3, because it says minus a, so I don't need to say minus a. And the value of b is 
um where did i where did i put that uh seven because it's minus b so you don't need to say negative seven and that's how we do that <clears throat> So another use of completing the square is that it allows me to find the turning point of a quadratic. So a quadratic is always going to look so, either like that or like that. And the turning point is either the minimum or the maximum point. So when I have the completed the square form, the turning point, uh, so let's say it's written in the form um, x plus n squared um, take m. Whatever is in here, it's going to be the opposite. That's going to give you the x coordinate, except it's going to be the inverse of n. So be minus n, and then whatever this is, that's going to be your y coordinate. Okay, so it's the inverse of whatever's inside the bracket, and then whatever is the little outside bit, the correction value. So <clears throat> let's complete the square. So when I complete the square, I look at this part first. So I'm going to halve the coefficient of x and let's see what that gives me. x plus 2 squared is going to expand to make x squared plus 4x plus 4. And the equation I've been given is x squared plus 4x take 12. So how do I get from plus 4 to negative 12? I'm going to have to subtract 16. So therefore, the completed the square form would be x plus 2 squared take 16. And what would the coordinates be? Well, remember, we have to do the inverse of whatever's inside the bracket. So that would be negative 2, negative 16. So the value of a would be negative 2. And that means that the minimum point or the maximum point would be negative 2, negative 16. And that's how we do that. Okay, so here I am dealing with functions. So the first question is asking me to find the value of f of 3. Now, when all a function is, is you're substituting something into, like, imagine it's like a machine. So f of 3 means wherever I see the x value, I'm going to substitute 3 into it. So that would be 3 times 3 plus 2 over 3. 3 times 3 is 9, so that would be 9 plus 2 over 3. 9 plus 2 is 11. So f of 3 is going to be 11 over 3. So that's how I'd do that one. And then we've got a slightly trickier one. So we've got an inverse function. So what I want to do when I've got an inverse function is just start by um, making it equivalent to y equals 3x plus 2 over 3. So I'm just going to... Um, Instead of saying f of x, I'm going to say y equals 3x plus 2 and find the inverse. So how could I solve this to make x the subject? First thing I do is multiply both sides by 3. So that would be 3y equals 3x plus 2. Next step, I would take 2. So 3y take 2 equals 3x. And finally, I divide both sides by 3. So 3y take 2 over 3 equals x. Um, and the final part is, I to write that out as the inverse, I would say the f minus 1 of x. And wherever I've got y, I'm just going to switch them. So that would be 3x take 2 over 3 is the inverse of that function. So composite functions, what I do when I do these is I always start um, from the inside out. So first of all, I'm going to find out what g of 3 would be. So I'm going to substitute 3 into um, wherever I see an x. So g of 3 would be 3 times 3, which is 9. So I know g of 3 is 9. Now I need to find f of g of 3. So what I'm going to do is substitute g of 3 into here. And I know that g of 3 is 9. So I'm going to essentially say f of 9. So th 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 here, I'm going to say 3 brackets 9 take 2, which is 9 take 2 is 7. So that would be 3 times by 7, which is 21. And that's how I'd do that. So you start from the inside out and you'll work your way out. 
So here I'm dealing with a reciprocal. Now all a reciprocal is, is like the flipped fraction. So in this case, the reciprocal of one over the square root of five, I'm just gonna flip the fraction. So the reciprocal is gonna be five over one. And I need to find this. This is a calculator paper. So I just substitute that into my calculator, put the fraction button, put it in the third, square root of five over one, it's going to give it to you in a third form, so you press the SD button. And that gives you 2.236067, so forth, and your answer is to two decimal places. Circle the second digit, look next door, so that would be 2.24. And that's all you do to find the reciprocal, you just flip the fraction. Okay, so here I've got a bounds question. So I'm told that... Evie's van can safely carry a maximum loads of 587 kilograms and she wants to use her van to transport 25 crates of aubergines each weighing 13 kilograms to the nearest kilogram. Um, okay <coughs> and 35 crates of cucumber each weighing 6.5 kilograms to the nearest 500 grams. Can she safely use her van to transport her shop's groceries? So what I am essentially being asked to do is find out whether all of her aubergines and cucumbers weigh less than 587 kilograms if they have been if the, if they are the absolute maximum weight that they can be so 13 kilograms to the nearest kilogram well the nearest kilograms actually let's uh, do this a little bit bigger so i've got 13 here the nearest kilogram would be 12 and 14 and when would it round down to 13 so it's been rounded to the nearest kilogram so that must mean that the maximum and the minimum that it could be <coughs> is 13.5 kilograms or 12.5 kilograms now just because this is a bounds question everyone's just like oh but if it was 13.5 kilograms it would round to 14 yes in theory but because it would take forever to write 13.49 recurring we just assume that with a bounds question um we just allow it so the maximum weight it could be is 13.5 kilograms technically 13.499999 recurring but you get the drift so the absolute maximum weight uh crates of aubergine could be 13.5 kilograms so i'm going to do 25 times by 13.5 to figure out how much um her aubergines might weigh 25 times by 13.5 is <clears throat> 337.5 kilograms i do the same to figure out the possible maximum weight of her cucumbers so they weigh 6.5 kilograms to the nearest 500 grams so that means that it could have been the boundaries that i'm measuring in <coughs> are to the closest 500 grams so this is where it gets a little bit trickier and i'm finding the midpoint between my possibilities so because it's already it's not a whole rounded figure, it's half a kilogram. My bound is gonna be within 500 grams rather than a kilogram like it was here. So here there, there could have been a difference of a kilogram, here it's gonna be 500 grams. So half between 6.5 and seven, that would be 6.75 kilograms and halfway between six and 6.5 is 6.25 kilograms. So the maximum weight that the cucumbers could be would be 6.75 kilograms. I've got 35 crates, so I'm going to do 35 times by 6.75, which is, so this is the joy of a calculator paper, 35 times 6.75 is <clears throat> 236.25 kilograms. So if I add them together, do they weigh less than the maximum load of 587? Well, let's see. 236.25 plus 337.5 337.5 is 573.75 kilograms so evie is in luck because the absolute maximum that they could weigh if they've all been measured incorrectly and all weigh the absolute maximum um would be 573 so evie is good to go <laughs> okay so in this question i'm being asked to find the volume of the prism below now 
a prism is literally <clears throat> just a 3d solid where the face or the cross section is constant throughout so if you imagine like the colin the caterpillar cake um that you might have had as a kid um or might still have for your birthdays it's kind of like a um sort of oval circle each if you cut the cake at any point it would still be that circular shape the slices are in that shape um however an ice cream cone if you cut that that the shape gets smaller and smaller and smaller so a prism is where it's a constant cross section throughout and because of this to work out the volume of any prism no matter what shape, even if it was this weird like i don't know what what that is but let's imagine it was this weird shape you could still work out the volume of that prism because it has a constant cross section so the volume of any prism you just work out the area of the cross section which is normally the front face so in this case it will be this face here and you multiply it by the depth or the width or whatever you want to call it let's call it the length <clears throat> So how deep it goes so in this case what we need to do is find out the area of the trapezium because this is a trapezium so the formula for the area of a trapezium and there are loads of ways of writing it but the way i prefer is just saying a plus b so the two parallel sides times by the height divided by two so a and b good way to remember it they're just the two parallel sides so you just add them two together so in this case the two parallel sides are eight and 12 so i'm going to say eight plus 12 and the height is always the perpendicular height not the slant height so in this case it's three and then i'm going to divide that by two eight plus 12 is 20 20 times three divided by two is 60 divided by two which is 30 centimeters squared so the area of the trapezium is going to be 30 centimetres squared. And then all I do to work out the volume is multiply the area of the cross section times by the length. So 30 centimetres times by 10, which would give me 300 centimetres cubed. Remember, volume is always measured in centimetres cubed because it's a three dimensional shape. Area is two dimensional, which is why it's centimetres squared. Okay, so in this question, I'm being asked to find the total surface area of the cone below. So this is where I need to be really careful because I'm given the um, formula for the finding the curved surface area, but that's just going to be, if you imagine an ice cream cone, that's just going to be the cone part that you hold. Normally there's like ice cream going into it, so the top isn't covered. So I need to find the curved surface area, but also I need to work out the area of the base or the top, however you look at it. <clears throat> So I'm going to use the formula, but I'm also going to need to work out the area of that circular part at the bottom. So let's work out the curved surface area first. The formula is pi times by the radius times by the slant height. Um, so L just represents the slant height. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So pi is obviously a constant. The radius is four centimetres. And the slant height I've been given is 10 so i'm just going to say simplify that that would be 40 pi so the curved surface area is 40 pi now i could type that into a calculator and get a decimal but it's generally easier if you just keep things in terms of pi and then simplify it at the end so the curved surface area is 40 pi now i'm going to work out the area of the base over here so what's the area of a circle area of a circle is pi times by radius squared so i'm just going to do pi times by 4 squared which is 16 pi so i've got the area of the circle or the base or whatever you want to call it and the curved surface area so i want to add those two together to get the total surface area so the total surface area is 40 pi plus 16 pi which is 66 pi and this is where I can type it into the calculator. It hasn't actually told me whether to leave it as a decimal or not, but let's just give both options. So either 66 pi, or I could say 207.3451151 centimeters squared. Um, and let's round that to two decimal places, 0.35 centimeters squared. Remember to give your units, it's an area so area is always going to be centimeter squared meter squared whatever it is it's two dimensions so it's going to be something squared 
similarly over here I'm being asked to find the total surface area of the hemisphere shown below now a hemisphere is half a sphere so I'm being asked to work out the surface area of this hemisphere now the surface area of a full sphere is 4 times pi times radius squared this is a hemisphere so just this part here that part there that would be half of the surface area of the sphere so to work out that part there that I've kind of shaded in really awfully I would do 4 times pi times radius squared divided by 2 and then it's a total surface area so just like with my cone I also have this bit here that I need to take into account so I'm going to have the little um, curved part there the area of that and then I also need the base which is going to be a circle so the area of that is just going to be pi times radius squared and I'm going to substitute in the values that I've been given so for one I'm going to do in this color so i'm going to do four times by pi times by 3.5 squared and if i just type that into a calculator four times 3.5 is 14 so that's 14 pi um but it's a half a sphere so i'm going to divide that by two so 14 pi divided by two is seven pi so this the area of this part here is seven pi and secondly, I need to work out the area of the base. So I'm going to do pi times 3.5 squared. So 3.5 squared is 12.25. So that would be 12.25 pi. Once again, I can just add these together. So my total surface area is going to be 12.25 plus 7, which is 19.25 pi. And if I press the SD button, that is going to convert it into, if I type in, sorry, 19.25 pi, and then press the SD button, that's going to convert it. So that's going to be 60.475658, so forth. So my total surface area to two decimal places is 60.48. And once again, it's going to be centimetres squared because it's an area. Okay, so this question deals with similar shapes. Um, so the cool thing about similar shapes is that they're always going to be increasing or decreasing according to the scale factor. So linear shapes, I mean, similar shapes have a linear scale factor. So let's say the linear scale factor is x. The area scale factor is going to be x squared. And the volume scale factor is going to be x cubed. So what we want to do is work out the linear scale factor for this shape. So we want to think, okay, what do I multiply 15 by to get to 32? So I can do 32 divided by 15. Type that into my calculator. 32 divided by 15 gives me 2.13 recurring. Not the nicest number, but hey, we've got a calculator. So 15 times by 2.13 recurring would get me 32. And 32 divided by 2.13 recurring would take me back to the smaller shape. So that's my linear scale factor. So linear scale factor is 2.13 recurring. To work out the volume scale factor, I'd have to do this cubed. Because it's a volume. So I'm going to cube that, which gives me 9.709 zero three seven zero three seven so not the nicest number to work with but you can just use that as your answer so i'm told that the smaller bottle can hold a volume of 300 milliliters so if we're talking about volume we've got 300 milliliters and then the unknown volume of the larger one but i know that my volume scale factor is 9.70 so to get from the smaller bottle to the larger bottle I'm going to multiply by this scale factor so 9.70 blah 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 times by 300 gives me 2912.71 recurring so the volume of the large bottle and once again it hasn't asked me to round so I'll just round it to two decimal places would be 
2912.71 millilitres. And, and that's how I'd work out that. So in this question, I've been given a triangle. And what's important to notice about this triangle is that it has two sides of equal length. And I know that because it's represented by these two little lines here. That shows me that is an isosceles triangle. And an isosceles triangle has two equal sides and two equal base angles. So I'm being asked to find the perimeter of this triangle. And all I know is the length of the base and the perpendicular height. So the heights I'm trying to figure out are these two. And if I work out the size of one, then I just double it because they're equal sides. So um, if I find out one, I found out the other. So what can I do? Well, I've got a perpendicular height and I've got the base. So what I can do, because it's an isosceles triangle, I can split it in half and then I create a right angled triangle. And if I've got a right angled triangle, I can use Pythagoras. So if this was my right angle triangle, Half of the base would be three and the um, side over here would be 14 because it's the same as the perpendicular height. So what I can do is work out the hypotenuse, which is here. So Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'm just going to substitute the values. Remember, a and b are the two shorter sides. C is always the hypotenuse, which is the longer side, which is the side that is opposite the right angle. So I'm going to say 14 squared plus 3 squared equals c squared. So let's just type that into the calculator. 14 squared. 14 squared plus 3 squared is 205. So 205 equals c squared. So therefore c is going to be the square root of 205. And the square root of 205 is 14 point one uh three one seven eight two one oh six so that's the length of this side here fourteen point three one seven and this side here fourteen point three one seven so I've worked out the hypotenuse which is the length of that slanted type and to work out the perimeter I'm just gonna go all the way around the triangle so I'm gonna add fourteen point three one seven plus so I'm going around here that's part next part over here plus 14.317 plus the whole of the base six centimeters here which gives me 34.635642 and it says to two decimal places so the second decimal place is a three the number next to it is a five so i'm going to add one more so 34.64 to two decimal places so here I've got a time question. I'm told that Wale drives 230 miles from Bristol to Norwich. He drives at an average speed of 72 miles per hour. He leaves Bristol at 7 a.m. At what time um, does he arrive in Norwich? Before 10.30 a.m. Okay, so um, let's see what's happening here. What's the formula for speed, distance, time? Remember, if you forget it, just write down what the national speed limit is, which is 90, 70 miles per hour. What does that mean? Well, 70 represents speed. Miles represents distance. And per means out of. So divided by an hour is time. So therefore, if you forget it, then you can literally write out the national speed limit and then think of the, the formula for yourself. So speed equals distance over time. Right, let's see what we can substitute. So I know the distance is 230 miles, so I can substitute that. Um, no, sorry, why did I put that in a speed? So I know the distance is 230 miles and I know the speed is 72. And what I don't know is the time taken. So how could I work this out? Well, I could rearrange the equation so times both sides by, let's just call that t, just so that I can turn it into algebra. So 72t is 230, therefore t is going to be 230 over 72. You could also just rearrange the formula if you know the speed distance um, 
time triangle so if you're trying to work out the time you know that would be distance divided by speed but whatever works best for you so i do 230 divided by 72 230 divided by 72 is 3.194 hours okay so if i want to turn that into minutes then i can times that by 60 so that would be 191.6 minutes and essentially i just want to know what 0 0.194 minutes is recurring sorry hours is as minutes so i could just times that little part here um, so either you could have timed this to figure out how many minutes there are in total and you know in an hour there's 60 minutes so 60 minutes would be one hour 120 minutes would be two hours and 180 minutes would be three hours which means from 180 to 191 you have 11.6 minutes left so you know the total um, time would be three hours and 11.6 minutes or you could have just been like okay it's 3.194 hours so i'm just going to multiply this by 60 to figure out what that would be in minutes whichever way works best for you but the time that it's taken to drive from bristol to norwich is three hours and 11.6 minutes so he leaves at um 7 a.m and you need to figure out if he's going to arrive in Norwich before 10.30. Well, what's 7 a.m. plus 3 hours and 11.6 minutes? 7 plus 3 is 10, so that would be 10 a.m. plus 11.6 minutes would be 10, 11 a.m. Like that's well before 10.30, so we don't need to worry about um how many seconds it is we could just round it to the nearest minute so we could even say he will definitely arrive before 10 12 a.m which is before 10 30 so yes so here i'm being asked to share into a ratio kira emma and jamie share a pack of sweets in the ratio shown below and once again um, they haven't given me the ratio of everyone compared to everyone else. They've just given me the ratio of Kira to Emma and Emma to Jamie. So what I can do is first of all, Kira to Emma is six to four. So six parts, one, two, three, four, five, six to four parts. It always helps if you just visually represent it. So that's Kira and that's Emma. And I know that Kira has 18 Maltesers. So Kira has six parts and they sum to 18 Maltesers. So what I can do is figure out how much one part must be worth. So 18 divided by six is three. So each little part must be worth three. And therefore Emma must have 12. So Emma has 12 Maltesers. Um, and I need to figure out how many Jamie has. So once again, I could do the ratio comparing Emma to Jamie. So it's two to nine this time. So Emma has two parts. That's ugly, so I'm just gonna make it a little bit neater. So Emma has two parts and Jamie has nine parts. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now I know that the two parts that Emma has must be equal to 12 because Emma has 12 Maltesers. That means in this comparison of ratio, each part is equal to six. So therefore, if Jamie has nine parts, I'm gonna have to do nine times six to figure out how many he has. And that would be 54. So Jamie, has 54 Maltesers. Lucky Jamie. <laughs>
Okay, so here I'm being asked to turn a fraction to a percentage. So Isla sits a drama exam. She gets 49 out of 52 marks correct. In order to get a merit, she needs to achieve 96%. So I need to figure out what 49 out of 52 is as a percentage. So what I can do is, first of all, turn it into a decimal. And how do I turn a fraction to a decimal? I just divide it. So I do 49 divided by 52. This is a calculator paper. So just plug it in and that would give you 0.9423 recurring. Um, so now I wanna turn it into a percentage. And how do you turn a decimal into a percentage? You just multiply by a hundred. So multiply this by 100 hopefully you already see that that is not sadly going to be a merit it's going to be 94.23 so forth percent so sadly no she hasn't achieved a merit but she was very close okay so over here i have three people's ages that i've been given and i'm going to need to form an equation so generally if you haven't been given the information um you're going to use algebra so brooke is five years older than phoebe fabio is five years younger than phoebe and luca is twice phoebe's age so i've actually been given four people's age so phoebe seems to be the common factor so let's call phoebe x so we don't know what phoebe is but we can just call her x because x is the most common variable so if phoebe is x brooke is going to be five years older than phoebe so it'd be whatever phoebe is which is x plus five fabio is going to be five years younger so whatever phoebe's age is it's going to be five less than that and the final person luca is twice Phoebe's age. So whatever Phoebe is, which is X, you double it. And with algebra, we always simplify. So instead of writing X times two, um, you just write it as two X. Now I know that the sum of all their ages is 40. Now sum just means added together. So what I can do is write those out all together. So that would be X plus X plus five. So all of it plus x take 5 plus 2x must sum to 40. So I've added all their ages together. And let's just write this out here so that there's more space for working. And what I need to do now is solve this to find out what the value of x is. So let's collect the like terms first. So x plus x plus x plus 2x, that's 2, 3, 4, 5. 5x five plus 5, take 5 is 0, so 5x equals 40. So let's solve it. We'll divide both sides by 5, so x would be 8. So if x is 8, I can then figure out what Brooke's age is. Now, ugh, I deleted it, but Brooke's age, the expression for that would be x plus five and fabio's age was x take five so i know that x is eight so therefore brooke is going to be x plus five so eight plus five which is 13 years old and fabio is going to be x take five which is eight take five which is three years old now I need to work out Brooke's age as a percentage of Fabio's age. So this is where it gets a little bit trickier. So Brooke's age is a percentage of Fabio's age. So I'm going to write Brooke's age over Fabio's age, turn it into a decimal. So 13 divided by 3 is 4.3 recurring and then multiply it by 100 um, to get the percentage. So that would be 433.3%, which makes sense because she's a lot older than him. So he, she's roughly four and a third times older than him. Does that make sense? Yes, because three times four is 12 and one year is a third of three. 
So she is 433.3% of Fabio's age. So in this question, I'm being asked to work out um, what interest rate a bank paid her. So Jenny puts £3,000 into her savings account. She leaves the money in the account and after seven years, she has 5248 What interest rate did the bank account pay her? So this is a compound interest question. So I know that she put in £3,000 and then whatever the percentage multiplier was, so whatever the interest is, that's the percentage multiplier. Um, so X to the power of seven, because that's the number of years she left it in, must equal £5,248.92. So let's see what we can do here. Well, let's rearrange the equation. So I know that x to the power of 7, if I divide both sides by 3,000, must be, so 5248.92 divided by 3,000, gives me 1.74964. So whatever the percentage multiplier is, which is the interest rate, is x, to the power of 7 is that. So to figure out what x is, I'm going to need to do the seventh root of this number. So in your calculator, you press that button and you press 7 root. 1.7496.4 which gives you x is 1.08319577.4 so remember when you're doing percentage multipliers it's the original amount plus the percentage increase which in this case is the interest rate so um if i multiplied 1.08 times by 100 that gives me 108.319%. So therefore, if I took 100 away from that, my percentage increase is 8.31957, so forth. So that is the interest rate that must have been paid to her because she's made quite a nice little bump up, right? So the interest rate is 8.3, let's just say 8.32% interest. Um, now, you can double check this because how do you work out the, um, how do you use compound interest? Well, it's always the original amount times by the multiplier. So that is your interest rate to the power of years. Okay, so the original amount is 3,000. The multiplier I'm using is 8.32% interest. So obviously 100 plus 8.32 is going to give you 108.32. Divide that by 100 is 1.0832. And I do that to the power of 7 because she's left it in for 7 years. So 3,000 times by 1.08. I'll just do the original amount, so 319. I didn't actually write the whole thing out, which is an error, but let's just do it to the power of seven, gives me £5,248.72. That's because I didn't write out the whole value, but you know that you've got it right. So that is my interest rate. Remember, the interest rate is the bit you don't include the 100% because that's the original value. So in this question, I am being asked for a percentage decrease. So Ashita buys a car for £25,000 and Casey buys a car for £22,000. Three years later, Ashita's car has been decreased in value by 15% and Casey's car has decreased by 12%. Whose car has the greatest value? So what do I do with a percentage decrease? I do the same thing. I do the original times by my multiplier. To the number of years to the power of the number of years so what's my original value for ishita i'm going to say that's twenty five thousand times by the multiplier so hers has decreased by 15 percent. so it's a decrease so i'm going to do 100 to take 15 which gives me um 85 percent so turn that into a multiply and to turn it into a multiply you just divide by 100 because percent means 100 so that would be 0 0.85 
and to the power of how many years is it? Three. So let's type that out. 25,000 times by 0. Point, um, oh, no. times by 0. 0.85 to the power of 3 is 15,353.125. Okay, now let's work out Casey. So her original value is 22,000. Her multiplier, well, her car decreased by 12%. So 100 take 12 is 88. So her percentage, we're trying to figure out 88% of her value. As a multiplier, that would be 0 0.88. And once again, it's to the power of 3 because it's in um, 3 years we're trying to work out. So we do 22,000 times by 0 0.88 to the power of 3. And that gives me... £14,992.38. Um, so that would be 13 pence if I rounded it. So therefore, whose car has the greatest value? Even though it's a bigger percentage decrease, Ashita's car has the biggest value. And that's how we do that. So in this question, I'm being asked to estimate the total number of nurse sharks in the Maldives which is a really exciting question um however estimating the population size can be a bit of a tricky kind of concept to get your head around so essentially what the formula is is to estimate a population size you essentially capture a selection so let's say the fishing boat goes out and it captures a selection of sharks just to see them it marks all of them and then it releases them all out and then after a certain date it does the same thing and however many are captured and marked the proportion of the marked to the amount that have been captured is used as an estimate for the total population so this will make sense when I try and put it into example. So for instance, the total marked on your first time, so that would be everything that you've captured on your first time, over the total population, the estimated population, is said to be equal to the number recaptured that are also marked over the total number of sharks that have been recaptured so let's put this into practice and let's just make that a little bit of a simpler formula so let's call the total marked m the total population will be p so total marks on your first time over the total population must be equivalent to the let's call it m the marked ones that have been recaptured over the total ones that have been recaptured OK, so that will be our little summary. So you might want to write this down because I'm just going to get rid of it to make space. So let's say let's let's put that into practice in this question. So the Maldives has a large population of nurse sharks. Marine biologists want to see how many there are. And fish nets are set overnight. And the next morning, 40 nurse sharks are captured. So my M is going to be 40 over the total population which i'm just going to call p i don't know what the total population is that's what i'm trying to work out and i do that by um figuring out what's in my sample size so one month later the same experiment is conducted and 50 nurse sharks are captured so the total recaptured is 50 and three of these are marked OK, so i've got two equivalent fractions and i'm trying to figure out what the total population is so i'm just going to rearrange this. So 40 must be equivalent to 3 50ths times by P. So therefore, if I divide both sides by um, 3 50ths, I'm going to end up with a population size. So an estimate for the population is going to be 40 divided by, and that's supposed to say 3, not 30, divided by 3 50ths is going to be... 40 divided by 3 50ths is 666.6 recurring. So I'm trying to work out an estimate for the nurse sharks. I don't want to chop a poor little shark into um, 0.6. So I'm just going to round it down um, because in real life you can't have 0 0.6 of a shark. So I'm going to say there's 666 nurse sharks in the Maldives and that's how I do that.
and this is called capture recapture so if it's not making sense let me know and i'll make a video in more depth okay so here i'm being asked to draw or complete a pie chart so what i need to know about pie chart is that the angles inside a pie chart always sum to 360 degrees because it's a circle um, and I can figure out how much one person, or if it was animals, one animal, one item must be. Because all of these 72 people are being represented inside this pie chart, which has 360 degrees inside it. So to fi figure out how much one person, um, how much space they take on the pie chart, I'm just going to do 360 divided by the total number of people, when the, which in this case is 72. So 360 divided by 72 gives me five. So one person takes up five degrees on the pie chart. So if I know that, um, then I can work out how much 13 people must take. So 13 people, I'm gonna do 13 times by five. 13 times by five is 65. So the angle for the tablets must be 65 degrees. I do 44 times five, and that's 220 degrees. Five times five, is 25 degrees and 10 times 5 is 50 degrees so these are the degrees um of my pie chart now i can double check that that's correct because all of this should add to 360 so let's just try that 65 plus 220 plus 25 plus 50 gives me 360 so i know i've done it right next what you're going to do is line up your protractor and actually just draw these angles so you just draw a straight line so you can use that as your base and you draw the first angle of 65 degrees so i don't have a protractor so i'm just going to estimate that that would be 65 degrees and i would then label it so that would be tablet so write how much the angle is and label it as well then i've got i'll do a the smaller one of computer then i've got 25 degrees over here so let's say that's 25 degrees and that is my computer then i'm gonna do 50 degrees and obviously i've this is not accurate because i don't have a protractor i'm just kind of estimating it um so that's 50 degrees that's going to be your laptop and then the remainder must be 220 degrees which is going to be people that use a phone and that's how you do your pie chart so essentially just do 360 divided by the total frequency to figure out how much one item one person one whatever must be on the pie chart and then multiply each little frequency by that amount and that tells you what angle it is and then draw it on the pie chart so here i've got some algebraic expressions and i'm being asked to find the mean of these expressions so the expressions below represent four numbers the value of the median of the expressions is 21 now what's the median well the median is the middle number however if there are two medians the median is the sum of two middle values divided by two so it's the halfway point between those two middle values so 2x plus 5x is 7x and 7x divided by 2 is 3.5x so the value of the median of the expressions is 21 so 21 must equal 3.5x so to figure out what x is i'm going to divide both sides by 3.5 and 21 divided by 3.5 is 6. So x is 6. If I know what x is, I can substitute that into all of the values. So this value must be 6, 2x must be 12, 5x must be 30, and 13 times by 6 is 78. So I need to work out the mean of the expressions. So I'm going to add them all together. So 6 plus 12 plus 30 plus 78 divided by 4. Because how do you work out the mean? So the mean is the sum of all the values. So all of them added together divided by the number of values. And there are four values. So... <coughs> 
6 plus 12 plus 30 plus 78 gives me 126. So the mean is 126 divided by 4, which is 31.5. So that is the mean of these expressions. Okay, so relative frequency just essentially means what is the probability of this thing happening given um, how many times I'm going to do it. So the relative frequency that represents 15 successes out of 60 trials. Well, the probability of that happening is 15 over 60. Can I simplify that? Um, yeah, 15 divided by 60. So let's divide both by 5. That would be 3 over 12 and then can I simplify that even further yep I can divide both by three so that would be a quarter so the relative frequency is a quarter which as a decimal is 0 0.25 you could also have just typed this into your calculator 15 divided by 60 and done it as a quarter I forgot it was a calculator paper so you know that the relative frequency is 0 0.25 now with these multiple choice questions always actually work it out don't try and just guess it and rush it just work it out and then circle the one that is the answer so here I've got um a slightly more worded question question so the biased spinner is spun all a biased spinner means is that it's not a fair one so it's slightly like what cheaters would use um or it's just a bit faulty and so the spinner is spun and the results are recorded in the table the spinner is spun once more use the table to estimate the probability that the spinner will land on red so red is over here I don't know how many times the spinner is spun, so I'm going to need to work out the total frequency because probability is always the number of times it's happening out of the num total number of tries. So number of times the event happens over the total number of tries. So, or total frequency. So let's say 14 plus 41 plus 3 plus 45 plus 37 equals 140. <coughs> sorry <coughs> so let's just add these all together to work out the total frequency remember frequency just means a total amount so the total frequency is 140 how many times does it land on red so the probability is 14 over 140 um which i could leave as that or i could simplify to a tenth so that's the probability that it will land on red if the spinner is spun another 400 times, how many times would you expect it to land on red? Well, if you're doing an expected probability, what you do is the probability of it happening, which I know is a tenth, times by the number of tries. Okay, so in this case, I'm just going to do a tenth times by 400, which gives me 40. So I would expect it to land on red 40 times. So this is another question on expected value. So the probability of getting a 3 is 0 0.34. So they've told you it in decimal form. And they've told you that the dice is rolled 245 so times. So remember, it's the probability of the event happening multiplied by the number of times you've tried it. So in this case, I'm just going to do 0 0.34 times by 245. And that's going to give me the estimate for the probability. So 0 0.34 times by 245 gives me 83.3. So you, it's a real life thing. So you would say 83 times because you can't get 0 0.3 of a roll. So in this question, I am being asked to complete a Venn diagram and I'm using set notation to do that. So first of all, a Venn diagram just means like all the possibilities of something happening. So this sign here means the universal set. So over here, it says the universal set is all of the numbers under 20. So that means um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up until 20 need to go inside this Venn diagram. OK. The ones that go inside of A, so this is the circle A, they are all the prime numbers. Okay, so 
what are the prime numbers? It might be helpful to start listing them. So that would be 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17 and 19. So they're the numbers that would go in A. And then over here, I know that the set B are all of the multiples of 3. And remember, the universal set is numbers under 20. That's why the prime numbers finish at 19. So what are the multiples of 3? Well, I've got 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. Then 21 is above 20. So um, that's what would go in, in B. And they're the numbers that would go in A. Now, inside the intersection, so inside this little bit here, that represents all the numbers that A and B have in common. So it helps to actually circle them. So I know that three is common to them both. And that is it. <laughs> because all the other multiples of three are obviously going to be divisible by three. So therefore, they cannot be prime numbers. So in the intersection, I'm going to have three. And then I'm just going to fill everything out. So I've got two, five, seven, 11, 13, 17, and 19 that would go in here. And then here I'd have six, nine, 12, 15, 18. So essentially any number that I haven't used out of these sets is going to have to go on the outside. So it doesn't go into A or B, um, but the universal set is all of the numbers under 20. So that would be zero that I haven't used. I haven't used one. I've used three. I haven't used four. Um, six I've used. Seven. I haven't used eight. Nine. Ten I haven't used. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen I haven't used. Fifteen. Sixteen I haven't used. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. And twenty I haven't used. So you might have wanted to like write them all out and then cross out the ones that you use. You do whatever works best for you. <clears throat> So that's how I'd fill in the diagram. Now, this is where a, little, a few people get confused and that's with the probability notation. So um, I'm just going to draw a little diagram here to show you what each of them means. So this means um, A union B. So that essentially means everything, the union of A and B. So it means everything that goes inside of A or inside of B, or both. So essentially, all of this part here, so all of the numbers that are in there, okay? And that's when it's the little, um, the U, so U for union. And then this over here means A intersect B. So that's the point of intersection for A and B. So that would be um, everything that is a part of A and B, so just that little bit here. So you might want to think, no, actually I'm not going to give that example. So the intersect, so the upside down U is the intersection, so this point here. So you need to determine A, um, UB, so we're just going to say what fits into that. So what fits into A union B? Well, that would be, oh gosh, all of these numbers, two, let's cross them out as we go along, 17, seven, 5, 11, 13, 19, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. Um, okay, hopefully that's all of them. Then let's determine A intersection B. Well, that one's easy because it's just 3. And then this sign here, if it's got like that, that just means the complement of. So where I've got B, let's say this was B. It essentially means everything that is not in B. So everything on the outside of B is what I include. Okay, so everything on the outside of B. So that would be 16, 14, 10, 5, 2, 7, 17, 11, 13, 19, 0, 1, 4, 8 and 20. So all of those numbers, I'm not going to, okay, fine, I'll write them out. So 16, 14, 10, 5, 2, 7, 11, 17, 13, 19, uh, 20, 8, 4, 1 and 0. Okay, and that's how we do that. And that's what probability notation is. So hopefully that makes a bit more sense. Okay, so here I have a tree diagram question. 
so i'm told there are pink and turquoise marbles in a bag um okay perfect because i've got pink and turquoise pens chloe takes a marble at random from the bag she does not replace it so this is a really key piece of information because it means whatever the probability is of taking a pink or whatever marble if she doesn't replace it the second time you choose it it's going to be less she then takes at random another marble from the bag and the probability of picking a pink counter from the bag is three eighths okay so construct and complete a tree diagram to show this information so chloe takes a marble doesn't replace it and then um takes another one so the probability of it being a pink one is three eighths and therefore the probability of it being a turquoise one would be five eighths so when you've got your probability the branches so this and this must sum to one so they must add to make one because it's the probability of something happening so the probability of pink is three eighths therefore not pink must be everything else so the second time though the probability of her getting a pink marble is going to be different so if she's picked a pink marble already the probability was three eighths if she's taken one out it's the probably bleh, the probability is going to be out of seven because there's one less marble and if she's already taken a pink marble that would be two sevenths so there that's what it would be here however if she's taken a turquoise marble there's still going to be seven but she hasn't taken there's still three pink ones so over here the probability would be three sevenths similarly if she's taken a pink marble the first time round um, the probability here is always going to be out of seven, but she hasn't touched any of the turquoise ones, so that's going to be five sevenths. And over here, if she's taken a turquoise one, um, then there's going to be one less turquoise. So that's how we'd do that um, tree diagram. Um, now, work out the probability that Chloe picks counters that are different colours. Okay, so this is where I choose what routes I can go along. So when you go along a probability tree, you go along the branches and you multiply the fractions. So I could go across here, so pink and turquoise. So pink and turquoise, I would do 3 eighths times by 5 sevenths. Another option I could have would be turquoise and then pink. So turquoise and then pink would be 5 eighths times by three sevenths if i did pink and then pink that's not a different color and if i did turquoise and turquoise that's not a different color either so the total probability would be whatever these are so let's do three times five is 15 eight times seven is 56 and same here so the probability once i've multiplied along the branches and i've worked out the probability i could have that all that and remember the and and the all rule if i'm working out the probability of this and that happening so the and rule i multiply that's why i multiply along the tree branches because it's the probability of this and this and when i get to the end um and when i get to the end it's the all rule because it's either the probability of picking pink and then turquoise or i could pick the probability of turquoise and then pink so that's why i add the probability together so 15 over 56 <clears throat> plus 15 over 56 is 30 over 56 so that's the probability that chloe picks counters that are different colors and that's how i do that okay so this question is on expected value and i have an incomplete table so in a large fruit bowl there are papayas kiwis and watermelons and mangoes julia picks a fruit at random from the fruit bowl and here are some of the probabilities so remember the sum of probabilities um is always going to be one so probability always sums to one so you know that this table is going to have to add to one and um, so we've got 0 0.4 plus 0 0.25 which is 0 0.65 so one take 0 0.65 is 0 0.35 so i know that these two um probabilities must sum to make 0 0.35 now I'm told that the number of mango to the number of watermelon is in the ratio of three to four. So I know that I need to split 0 0.35 into the ratio three to four. So all of this must be 0 0.35. So I could do 0 0.35 divided by, there are seven parts in total, which means each part, oh, this is, I've done that too small. One part is 0 0.05. So therefore, the watermelon is going to be three lots of 0 0.05, which is 0 
and the mango is going to be four lots of 0 0.05 which is 0 0.2 double check does it add to make 0 0.35 yes so you know you've done it right so that's me completing the table now it says there are 20 fruits in the bowl all together complete the table okay well to do that all i'm going to do is multiply the probability by the um <clears throat> by the by the amount so for papaya i'm going to do 0 0.4 times by 20 so that is eight for the kiwi i'm going to do 0 0.25 times by 20 and that's five for the watermelon i'm going to do 0 0.15 times by 20 which is three and for the mango, I'm going to do 0 0.2 times by 20, which is 4. And that is how I do that. Okay, so that's all for now. I hope that that was helpful. As always, if there's anything that you didn't quite get that I didn't explain quite enough, then just let me know and I can make a video explaining it in more detail. Or perhaps there's something that you want a harder question on, or perhaps you want an easier question on. Just let me know, drop a comment, and I'll see what I can do.